Tonight we're going to be taking you a little bit farther in the dragon revealed. This session we want to unfold the purpose that Satan has in bringing all of these Eastern mystical practices into Christianity and into the world. If you would, bow your heads and let's ask the Lord to be with us. Father in heaven, Father, we are talking about serious things. And I know that many who are watching and are here have questions. Father, I pray that you will answer these questions. I ask you, Father, that you will fulfill your promise, that if any man or woman willeth to do your will, they shall know of your instruction. Father, I ask you for your Holy Spirit and for the presence of your holy angels. Bind and cast out every evil thing. And Father, we thank you in the precious name of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Exodus chapter 25. Everything that we look at when we're examining any practice, we have to go back to the Word of God. Always to the Word of God. That's our foundation. Exodus chapter 25. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Let them make me a sanctuary, so that I may dwell among them. In the beginning, it was a tent made often out of sheepskin, lambskin, animal skins, fabrics. It was a tent, a temporary, movable dwelling. He said, I want you to make this tent so that I can come down and dwell in the midst of my people. And if you look at the description given in Exodus and the Old Testament on how the Lord laid out the tribes of Israel, there was actually what looks like a cross. And in the middle of all of these tents, well over a million, possibly two million people in the middle of the desert, And in the midst of this organized camp of people, God said, I want you to make a sanctuary, a hiding place. The word sanctuary, that's what it means, a place to hide, a place of covering. He said, I need to cover myself so that I can come down there and you won't be destroyed by the brightness of my glory. So in this sanctuary, when you walk through the outer court, And then you walked through the inner court. And then you walked into the holy place or the tabernacle of the congregation. And then you went one step farther behind the veil. That was the throne room of God. There was only one throne in the sanctuary. That was the Ark of the Covering. The Ark of the Covenant with the two covering cherubs that overshadowed the mercy seat. That was God's throne. So in one compartment, you had God's throne and there was a veil that separated him from the tabernacle of the congregation. And that veil, they say, was between six to eight inches thick and it had to be changed every year because of the blood that was sprinkled upon it. God designed for this sanctuary to be there so he could dwell among us in our midst. 2 Chronicles chapter 6, verse 17 and 18. Listen to what Solomon said when he was building the temple. Not just a tabernacle made out of skins and, and, and linen. Now it was going to be a solid structure that stayed in one place forever. He said, but will God in very deed dwell with men on earth? Behold, heaven and the heaven of heavens cannot contain thee. How much less this house which I have built. Isaiah 66, verse 1 through 2. The Lord says, Where is the house that ye build unto me? And where is the place of my rest? Where is the place of my permanent abode? For all these things hath mine own hand made, saith the Lord. But to this man will I look, even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit or mind, and that trembleth at my word. So God said, this is where I really want to dwell. Not in a a tent out in the middle of the camp, 
not in a, a building made of stone. I want to dwell in a temple that is cut out without hands. I want to dwell inside of the hearts and the minds of my people. Since the fall of Lucifer from heaven, he said, I want to be like the Most High. He said, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars or the angels of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation. I will be like the Most High. Many years ago when my children were both young, my son and my daughter were there one day and we were reading about the mountain of God. And if you look up that in, in a E sword or a Strong's Concordance, you'll see that phrase used throughout the scripture, the mount of God, the mountain of the Lord. And they asked me, they said, Daddy, what does that look like? And I asked my children, I said, draw me a mountain. You can ask any child to draw a mountain. Do you know what they'll draw? A pyramid. They draw a pyramid. And it's amazing to me because a pyramid lies four square. It's four square. And typically, it's as tall as each of its sides. Do you know the Bible tells us the new Jerusalem lieth four square and its height is equal to its sides? Some people say it's a cube. It may be, I don't know, but we don't have long to wait until He shows us. But there are evidence in the Scripture that it was a pyramid. It was a mountain. The new Jerusalem, a mountain. He tells us in Isaiah that He will set up a sign in the midst of Israel, in the midst of the land, I'm sorry, in the midst of Egypt. And He said, on the borders of the river, and if you go to the borders of the river Nile, in the midst of Egypt, between southern and northern Egypt, there's three pyramids there. There's the Great Pyramid and then the two smaller ones. And when I see that, I remember a verse in Zechariah where it talks about Christ returning to the earth after that thousand year rest. And it says that His foot will come down on the Mount of Olives and the Mount will divide into two mountains. And the New Jerusalem will come down in the middle on the Great Pyramid in Egypt, there's no capstone. There's no capstone. And I think that's amazing because the Bible speaks of our Savior and says He's the chief cornerstone and He's the headstone, the capstone. I think that that is there as a symbol. I think it's there as a symbol to let us know, to remind men that that day is coming. Lucifer said, I will sit upon the mountain of the congregation. He said, I'm going to control the people of God. I will be like the Most High. In Daniel chapter 9, verse 18 and 19, listen to what Daniel pleads. He says, O my God, incline thine ear and hear. Open thine eyes and behold our desolations. Desolation it's desolate. It's a place that has become a desert. It's a place that is barren. And Daniel is talking about his heart. He's talking about the Lord's people. Behold our desolations. We're famished and dry. He says, Behold our desolations and the city which is called by thy name. For we, are, we do not present our supplications before thee, for our righteousness, but for Thy great mercy's sake. O Lord, Adonai, our sovereign King, O Lord, hear and forgive. O Lord, hearken and do. Defer not for Thine own sake, O my God, for Thy city and Thy people are called by Thy name. So we see here from Daniel that the city of God and the people of God are one and the same. Yes, there's a literal city, but it's only a symbol of us. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16 and 17, the Lord asks each of us a question. He says, Know ye not that you are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwells inside of you? That's what Satan is trying to do. 
He's trying to get spirits, fallen angels, to take possession of the hearts and the minds of God's people. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 15-20, through 20, he tells us, What? Know ye not that your bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit, which is in you, which ye have of God, and you are not your own? Back a few years ago when the Lord brought me out of the martial arts, I had been a Christian, I had been baptized, but I don't believe I had really given myself to the Lord. When He brought me out of the martial arts, when He delivered me from all of my sins, He began to teach me from His Word like I had never seen before. And I started paying attention to something. I started paying attention to the tenses of the verbs that I read in Scripture. He says here, He says, Know ye not that your bodies are, that's present tense, your bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit, which is in you. This is after Calvary. You don't have to ask Him to come and live inside you. You can ask and then thank Him because it's already done in Christ Jesus. Every promise is yea and amen. So I have to say, Father, I ask for Your Holy Spirit and I thank You because every good gift is yes and amen in Your Son. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2 says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you will present your bodies as living sacrifices. In the Old Testament, they sacrificed the blood of bulls and goats. You think, well, we don't have to do sacrifices anymore. Of course you do. The Bible tells us two types of sacrifice. The sacrifice of our will, our bodies, and the sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. That means you do something when you don't want to do it. That's a sacrifice. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will. He says, present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world or by this world, but be ye transformed through the renewing of your mind. If I'm watching Hollywood, what is my character going to be like? If I'm reading books of fiction, what is my character going to be like? If I knew I had three hours left before Christ returned, or three days, or three weeks, would I waste my time reading a novel? Or would I be searching the pages of Scripture with all I had? 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5-9 through 9 tells us, For we also, as living stones are built up a spiritual house. We are a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable unto God by Christ Jesus, that we should show forth the praises of Him who hath called you out of the darkness and into His marvelous light. Look at the tenses of the verbs. It says, we have been called out of the darkness into His marvelous light. When Christ looked with compassion upon men who were becoming corrupted, ruined, murdered, and lost, through choosing, through the power of choice, a ruler who chained them to his car as captives, and yet these slaves were so bewildered or confused, so beguiled and deceived, that they were actually pleased with their slavery as they moved on in gloomy procession toward eternal ruin. To death in which is no hope of life, toward night to which comes no morning. Christ saw human beings possessed with devils. He saw satanic agencies incorporated, joined, in union, yoked, with the bodies of men and becoming the habitation for the degrading indwelling of demons. I want to give you an example of something. Growing up as a Christian, I always thought of demons. You know, that's, that's one of these people that their head spins around backward and they're raving mad and they're throwing up and, you know, what you see in the movies. That's somebody that's possessed. I want to present a thought to you. Do you know that Sister White says 
that Judas was possessed with a demon of selfishness. You know, the Bible says in the Gospel of John that when Jesus was choosing His disciples, He said, Have not I chosen you twelve, and yet one of you is a devil? What did Christ do with Judas? What did He do with this man that had a demon living inside of him? Ellen White said, Jesus kept Judas as close to Him as possible, striving to win His heart. Because the moment that you yield your will to the will of God, that moment Satan loses his ground and his rights to take possession. So when we look at people and you talk about possession or you talk about people that are under satanic influence, it may not be somebody that's you know, raping people or murdering people or or screaming like Alice Cooper or or Ozzy Osbourne or somebody. It may be somebody that's selfish. It may be somebody that's full of lust and they can't overcome and they strive to overcome and they just can't seem to get the victory. It may be somebody that's bitter, that's angry, that has hate in their heart. It may be somebody that struggles with doubt and they just can't seem to overcome. It doesn't always mean the demon is on the inside. Sometimes the spirit may be on the outside just influencing Listen to this next statement. This shocked me when I read this. Same quotation. Men who were made for the dwelling place of God became the habitation of dragons. She just spoke about demons and evil spirits, and now she calls them dragons. The senses, the nerves, the passions and desires, even the very organs of man were worked by supernatural agencies in the indulgence of the grossest and vilest lust and desires. The very stamp of demons was impressed upon the countenances of men, and human faces reflected the expression of the legions of evil with which they were possessed. Such was the prospect upon which the world's Redeemer looked." What a horrible spectacle for the eyes of infinite purity to behold. Wherein can he behold his image? Christ was looking and saying, Is there no one here that I can see myself reflected in? When I was doing martial arts, even now, I have Christian men that will call me. Men that that go to church and the Spirit of God is striving with their hearts. They'll call me and they'll say, I have a question. I've been doing this art, and I I know they do the bowing and stuff, but what if I switched and I started doing, you know, Muay Thai, or I started doing kickboxing, or I started doing wrestling, or I started doing some other, you know, violent act? And I ask them, I say, can you see Jesus doing it? If you can't see Jesus doing it, if you can't see Paul or Peter or Matthew or John, if you can't see them doing it after their conversion then why would we do it? How does the Spirit of God feel when I'm punching somebody in the head? It doesn't make sense. If Jesus would turn the other cheek, if He told me to turn the other cheek, how can I block and counter and think that it's okay? She says, And yet God, the Infinite One, so loved this world that He gave in exchange as our substitute and our surety, His only begotten Son for such a world, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Satan is working to possess mankind. I want to read a scripture to you. I apologize I didn't have this one on the slide. I had left it off. It's a scripture that you're familiar with in Revelation chapter 18. Revelation chapter 18. This is after the latter reign of the Holy Spirit has fallen upon God's children. This is after God's people have been sealed with the seal of the living God. Revelation chapter 18, verse 1 through 3. Listen to what the Lord says. 
And after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. This is the loud cry. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and is become the habitation of devils. Jerusalem is God's people. Babylon is the rest of the world. My people that are called by my name, Babylon, which reflects the image of Satan. Babylon is fallen, is fallen, and is become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and the cage of every unclean and hateful bird. The Holy Spirit is represented by a dove. Isn't it amazing that the Lord uses birds, fowls, unclean fowls, to represent the fallen spirits? Do you understand what this is saying? It's saying that in the end, when, when that moment of probation is closed, when the door of the ark of safety is shut by the angel's hand, and every soul has made their decision, either for Christ or either for Satan, every soul will either be possessed by the Spirit of the living God or they will be filled with the spirits of Satan, with fallen angels. There was a movie that was released a few years ago, and it was based on a, on a story, on a comic book. There's video games now. There's comics that children are watching. Their parents go, it's just a cartoon. It's, it's make-believe. It doesn't matter. The name of this movie was called Avatar. Sometimes when I'm watching movies now, since the Lord has brought me out, if I'm seeing a preview, I don't watch Hollywood movies anymore, but when I see a preview and I see a name like Avatar... I think people in Hollywood didn't just sit around and, and let's just try to make up a name. They look for names somewhere. The word avatar is a Hindu Sanskrit word. It literally means the manifestation of the fallen ones or those that came down from the heavens. In one of the last of the three Star Wars film series, the newest film series, there was a princess called Padme. Do you know Padme is a Hindu goddess? It's the name of a Hindu goddess. How many millions of children across the world know that woman's name and look up to this character in this make-believe story? Second Corinthians chapter 6, verse 6 through 14. The Lord tells us, Wherefore come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. Don't pick the movie up. Don't watch that film on the internet. Don't pick that book up or that magazine up. And if your teacher is requiring you to read something that you know is against God, deny it. Say, no, thank you, I can't. Tell them you can't because the Lord Jesus Christ has told you not to. He says, touch not the unclean thing and I will receive you. Or for I will receive you. You're mine. I've already paid for you. And I will be a father unto you and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. And then the Apostle Paul goes on to say, having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Sometimes when, when we talk about possession, when we talk about yielding ourselves to God or someone who has surrendered their life to the, the enemy, about eight years ago, I received an email. The Lord had just begun reaching my heart. I had given my life back to the Lord. I told Him, I'm willing to do what you want me to do. I'm still teaching martial arts, but I'd quit teaching energy. I wasn't teaching chi or ki or prana. I quit teaching bagua. I quit teaching tai chi. I quit teaching the kung fu as far as the energy part of it was there. I was trying to do just the physical. And the Lord knew where I was. He was taking me one step at a time. And a person sent me an email to this day, I don't know who it was. But on this email, there was a link 
to two films. It was a clip, just a 10-minute preview of two films done by uh, a ministry called Good Fight Ministries. Now these films, we've also seen something similar done by Little Light Studios. If you don't watch Hollywood, I recommend watch them from Little Light Studios. But if you are watching Hollywood every week, watch the one from Good Fight Ministries first. When I watched that 10-minute preview, it was called Hollywood Unmasked, Volume 2. I watched it, 10 minutes, and I clicked the mouse, turned the computer off, and I called my wife. I said, honey, we've got to order these films. And she said, what are they about? I said, one is about Hollywood, and the other one is called We Sold Our Souls for Rock and Roll, both by the same ministry. And... She said, okay, you know, if you think we need to watch them, that's fine. And I was going to church every Sabbath, teaching in Sabbath school sometimes. Sometimes I would be asked to speak up front, still doing martial arts. And when sun went down on Friday evening or on Sabbath evening, I was turning the television on and watching Hollywood films. Now we had certain rules, you know, we're not going to watch it if it says uh, certain curse words. Certain ones, some of them we could bypass, we would tolerate. We wouldn't watch it if they said GD or took the Lord's name in vain. But I was still watching Hollywood. We got the film in the mail and my wife and I sat down after the children went to bed. It was two hours long. Hollywood Unmasked, Volume 2. After watching it, I threw every movie that I had. I had over 490. I had over 490 DVDs that I had collected over the years. I threw every one of them in the trash. And you know, I had people that tell me, you could take those and sell them. I mean, sell them. Get the money. You can use the money for the Lord. I was like, the Lord doesn't need my money. It's just paper money. It's monopoly money. What is He going to do with it? He needs these DVDs thrown away. When you watch these films in Little Light Studios, their film reveals the same thing. They interviewed. They interviewed. They showed uh, 60 Minutes interviewing Hollywood stars. People like Oprah Winfrey, Robin Williams, Denzel Washington, Keanu Reeves. And these Hollywood stars told where they got their power to act. They told them, I can't act that part. And I remember 60 Minutes in the interview, he asked, he said, how did you do that then? And Denzel Washington said, I went into my room and I knelt down and I prayed to the spirits. And I asked them to come into me. Oprah Winfrey said the same thing in the color purple. She said, the spirits, I asked the spirits of that character to take possession of me. And then I didn't have to act anymore. They did the acting for me. There are untold thousands of Hollywood stars that have been taken by a snare and they don't even know it. Marilyn Monroe, she talked in her diaries about the problem she had with demons. And everybody sees the pictures of her, what a, a glamorous and fabulous woman she was, and she was so beautiful. And you see the photograph of her on her deathbed, and you th on her deathbed, and you think, oh my, Father, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. And then we watch the video called They Sold Their Souls for Rock and Roll. And I, like I said, I do not recommend these videos. If you're not listening to rock and roll, don't watch it. It's, it's, it's rough. But for somebody that is watching it and listening to that kind of garbage, that type of music and filth, sometimes it takes something that startling to wake you up. And I have to tell you, I watched the Hollywood film. I can't watch it anymore. Even though it's exposing the darkness, once you know what darkness is, you don't have to go back and keep looking at it. Do you understand? I can't watch that anymore. I tried to watch it with, uh, with some people, and I had to just keep turning my eyes. They wanted to see it because they had never seen it. I couldn't look. I just kept praying for them that the Lord would convict them. What the Lord did in my life when He was bringing me out of the martial arts, He was also taking... The Hollywood out of my life. He was taking those spirits that had possessed me. And I, I mean that with 
the utmost clarity. He was setting me free from that which had taken possession of His temple. A lot of times, people are afraid to talk about demons. We don't need to glorify wickedness or evil. But look through Ellen White's writings. Type in the word demons or devils and read what she has to say. Read the admonitions that she gave to other men of God of our faith when she told them to go and help dispossess one of our pastors. I remember the day when the Lord first revealed to me what was going on in my life in the martial arts. I was there teaching on a Friday afternoon and I had private lessons on Friday, no group classes, just private lessons. And people would come in, I would spend an hour with them, teaching them, helping them with what they needed. And my class had left and I was up at the desk, I was going through checking the schedule to see who was coming in next, making notes, business stuff. And the UPS man pulled into the driveway and I always got excited when the UPS guy showed up because it was like, you know, opening up new packages. It was like a surprise. And uh, he walked in and he brought the package over and set it down. And he got the sheet of paper or the little pad that you have to sign for. And he handed it to me and he said, this is the amount. It's COD. You know, we need a check. So I got my checkbook out and all of a sudden I felt very strange. I can't, I can't put it into words what I felt. But I saw myself start filling the check out. And while I was watching my hand write the check, I realized that I was in the back seat of the car. Because if I write on this piece of paper, or if I point to that picture, or if I'm talking to somebody, my mind has to engage. My mind tells my hand what to do. As I was writing this check, I realized I wasn't controlling my hand. My hand was moving on its own, by some other force or spirit or mind. And the check, my hand finished filling the check out. I finished writing it and I was scared. I mean, I, inside I was shaking because I was realizing this is not good. And I knew from what I had watched on those films, I'm in big trouble. I just thought I've got to get this man out of here. So I signed the check, thanked him, he went out the door, and I went to the front of the school, and I locked the door, and I shut the blinds, and I started praying. I started praying. I did not know what to do. I said, Lord God, I need your help. In the name of Jesus Christ, get out of here. In the name of Jesus Christ, get out of here. Whatever this is, in the name of Jesus Christ, get out of here. And I started claiming the blood of Jesus Christ. And I did that for probably 30 minutes before it left. I want to tell you something. There's no weakness in the name or in the power of Jesus Christ, but it takes faith to move mountains. It takes faith to cast out a sin or an evil spirit that's influencing a life. It takes faith, and faith only comes by one thing, by the Word of God. So that means if you're struggling with a sin or you're struggling with an evil influence, if you're struggling in some part of your life, you go to the Word of God and find the promises that fit your case. And you write those down, type them out, put them on a piece of paper, and you read them out loud over and over and over again. Begin by reading every promise you can find on the love of your Father. Begin reading what happened at the cross, what was done for you and I in Christ Jesus on Calvary. Begin reading that and your faith will grow. For the Bible tells us that faith worketh by love. You must know that God loves you and that it is His, it is his utmost and greatest desire to set you free from whatever it is. As the Lord was pulling me out of martial arts, I remember one day I was, I was teaching a Bagua class and we were doing this, this form, this kata. It was circle walking. I had a, a group of beginners there, so it was a very basic form. And you walked around a circle, and you could have a pole or whatever you wanted. You had to have some object or some focal point in the middle. And you would move your hands, and you would begin walking in these positions. 
And you didn't move any slower or any faster than this. Everything was done very slowly, almost like Tai Chi. It was a very slow, smooth movement, circular, spiraling movement or spiraling energy. And as I was doing this form, I looked around on the faces of all the students that were there with me. There was probably 11 or 12. I don't remember exactly. But I'm doing these movements and I'm watching them because I, I could just go through the motions. I didn't have to focus to, to get that feeling of the chi. And I was watching them and we had been doing this for 20 or 30 minutes. And every one of them was drenched in sweat and they weren't moving any faster than this. They were drenched in sweat and their eyes, they were in a daze. It was like nobody was home. And I smiled to myself because I thought, they're getting it. They're touching energy. They're getting their first taste. The Lord brought me out of that, so I quit teaching all the, the chi and the energy arts. And I went home one night, and I remember I was still battling with certain sins in my life. And when I was looking for how to get free... I was looking for somebody that could tell me how to get free. I found website after website that talked about freedom in Christ and victory in Christ. And they kept making reference to a book called Breaking Generational Curses and Pulling Down Strongholds by a pastor, Vito Rollo. He's a man of God and a dear friend. Not of our faith, but I have no doubt this man knows the Lord. In this book, he was sharing how to claim the promises of God. And in claiming those promises, to break the generational curses that were upon us and to break the strongholds that Satan had built in our lives. And I kept seeing that book show up and I thought, I need to get this book. And then an impression came to my mind, call him. So I went on his website, they had their phone number there, and I made a phone call. It was probably 10 o'clock at night, 8 o'clock. I don't remember. It was late. I know my wife and children were gone or upstairs. And I called him and he stayed on the phone with me for two hours. Did not ask me for a penny. He stayed on the phone with me for two hours that night. And at least another hour the next night. And at least another hour a couple of nights later. And he kept encouraging me to come to freedom. He kept teaching me how to claim the Word of God and the promises over the lies of the enemy. So what, what was happening here as the Lord was helping me to get free, He also showed me a website by this man. And I had typed in his name and I had typed in the name of his book. And I remember when I was first looking for that book, and I first entered that name and the name of that book in, in the Google search. And I hit enter on the first page. Guess what came up? The top article, it said, Christianity and Martial Arts by Vito Rollo. And I looked at it and I thought, I just want to be free from some sin. I, I got rid of the chi. I got rid of the bagua and all the, the mystical stuff. I'm not bowing to anybody and taking my shoes off anymore. I don't want to know anymore. And I remember I pushed my chair back from the desk and I looked up into heaven and I told the Lord, I didn't know any better than just talk to Him, which is good. I think that's what He wants. I said, I don't want to see this. I, just, I don't want to read this, God. I don't want to read this article. And I heard the Lord speak to me. I heard Him speak in my heart and in my mind. I heard Him say, Eric, it's your choice. It's your choice, my son. And that broke my heart because he didn't force me to read that article. And I pulled my chair back up to the computer and I clicked enter on that link. And I read an article about how you can't separate the physical martial arts from their spiritual roots. And I battled with that for a few days. And as I was still teaching my classes, I remember my students, they saw something was happening to me. 40% of my students had left the school when I quit teaching energy because that's what they wanted. They wanted to learn the mystical stuff. Nobody cares about just punching and kicking. I want to know how to do it with power. So I lost 40% of them then. 
So with the 60% left, they all saw what God was doing in my heart, what Jesus Christ was doing inside of me. And I remember one day after a class, one of my students that had been a student for probably nine or ten years, she came up to me, and she was older. She was you know, a few years older than me. She came up and she said, you'd rather talk about the Bible now than you would martial arts, wouldn't you? And I looked at her and I smiled, and it was like I realized that if I could get somebody just to mention God during class, we would spend 30 or 40 minutes talking about the Bible, and I would forget all about teaching martial arts. And I looked at her and I said, you're probably right. And I knew from that day, okay, Lord, it's yours. So I told my whole school, I said, we're going to have a seminar. And whenever we had seminars, that meant we were going to show some really neat stuff that we didn't do normally. So everybody came. I don't remember how many were there, probably 60 or 70. All these people came and they're dressed in their uniforms. They had notebooks so they could take notes. They were ready for training and to learn. And I got up in front of the blackboard and I shared with them a presentation similar to the one that I've been sharing with you. And I told them, tonight is the last night that I will ever tie a belt around my waist or a sash. And I told them that I had renounced the martial arts. And I closed the door of the school a week or two later. Now my wife was scared. My wife was scared. I mean, you know, the Lord was bringing us back together. We weren't, we hadn't tied the knot yet, but He was bringing us back together and... She was like, you know, you're going to quit? What, I mean, that's your livelihood. You've done that for 24, almost 25 years. You just, you're going to just quit? What are you going to do? And uh, I said, I don't know. I said, but God told me to stop. I'm stopping. And I took everything home. We got rid of the school, got rid of the building. And I had boxes full of all the books and boxes full of all the pictures, all these pictures that I had up at the school Thousands of dollars worth of stuff from the martial arts. And my wife said, what are we going to do with all this? I said, well, some of it I need to save. I feel like I need to save it because one day I want to be able to share these dangers and I'm going to need this stuff to help. So I waited for a little while. And a few months passed and the Lord came and He knocked on my heart. And He said, Eric, He said, why are you saving that stuff? If you need a quote, you can find thousands of them on the internet for free. Throw the stuff in the trash. And I remembered something. In the Bible, in the Old Testament, when God would send His people into the pagan countries, He would tell them to burn with fire the pagan high places. Burn their idols in fire. So we built a big bonfire in my backyard. And my son and daughter thought this was the greatest thing in the world. My wife was scared. She was like, it's a little bit big of a fire. But I remember... I threw all these books in there, all these videos that I had, threw the pictures in there. Um, I took the certificates of the ranks I had made and I photocopied them. And I took those certificates out there and I put those in the fire. And you know, a certificate's just made out of parchment paper. I remember when I put the black belt certificate in there, the first one that I had received, it took almost 10 minutes for it to burn. It's a piece of parchment paper. It sat there and it sizzled and it smoked. And this was a big fire. It would not burn. And I kept praying and praising the Lord. I said, greater is He that is in me than he that is in this world. I am more than conqueror through Him that loves me. And then I took the belts and the sashes and I threw them in there. And I got to the black belt and I put it in. They're made out of polyester, sometimes mixed with cotton. That black belt sat there for probably 25, 30 minutes and burned. And then a day later, I had one of my students call and he offered to pay me $50 for my belt. I said, what are you going to do with it? It's not like you could wear it. What are you going to do with it? He said, I just want that belt. And I realized then, Satan wanted to pass that spirit on. If that young man had taken that belt, the devil would have had rights to influence his life. He wouldn't have went into him but he would have had rights to go into his home. I want to share with you the most important part of the story. Malachi chapter 4, verse 5 through 6. 
When you go home tonight, read Malachi chapter 4 and look up what Ellen White had to say about Malachi chapter 4. It will surprise you. It surprised me. He says, Behold, I send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. That's now. Last days. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to their children and the hearts of their children to the fathers. Do you know what that means to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children and the children to their fathers? I looked that up and I went back to the Old Testament. And do you know that every, almost every place that I looked up fathers and, and sons and fathers and children, almost every place, it was so that the fathers would teach the children God's laws. That was the whole purpose, was to raise up your children knowing the paths of righteousness. This was me teaching my children when they were young. And it was funny because I still wasn't out of the martial arts. I still hadn't given my life to the Lord. But they came to me one day with a little red book. And they said, Daddy, we remember when you used to read this to us. Read it to us. And I didn't want to read it. But it was my children. How do you say no? And I started reading those words and it was like conviction was just coming to me. Listen to what the Lord says. This is my son after my wife and I were reunited and our family. That our sons may be as plants grown up in their youth. And that our daughters may be as cornerstones polished after the similitude of a palace. Do you remember when Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you? That place is a temple made without hands. It's us that our daughters may be polished after the similitude of a palace, after the likeness of the most beautiful place you have ever seen. For the Lord shall comfort Zion. He will comfort all her waste or desolate places. That means your home, your marriage relationship with your spouse, your family. He will make your wilderness like Eden. And He will make your desert like the garden of the Lord. If you're interested in this, send me an email because I've got promises from Scripture that I had never seen before. God promised. I don't want you to get back together with your wife just because it's the right thing to do. I mean, what do you want to do? Be unhappily wed for the rest of your life? God said, I want to do above and beyond all that you can ask or imagine. He said, I will turn your wilderness into the garden of Eden. That is beautiful. He says, joy and gladness shall be found therein, thanksgiving and the voice of melody. I thank you all so much for coming. I thank our viewers for listening and watching tonight. And I encourage you, contact us. Contact us by email. Go to our website, secretdangersofmartialarts.wordpress.com. Go there and look for the answers from the Word of God. You won't be disappointed. Let's thank the Lord. Father in heaven, Father, we thank you so much. Father, I don't even know how to say thank you. Words are not enough. Father, we know your son is soon to return. Everything around us is shaking. Father, I pray for each person that is here and for every son and daughter of yours that is across the world and watching this series. Father, I pray that you will win our hearts. Father, open our eyes. Show us your love and your power. Set us free that we might be free indeed. And Father, I thank you for doing this. For you have promised in your word that your word shall not return unto you void. In Jesus' name, amen.